Welcome to the office. Hey guys, how you doing? I'm Dr. Rahim and I just want to first of all thank everybody that's been a part of this community, this channel. Uh, I'm very grateful, uh, appreciative of everyone that's helped support us by just being a subscriber, by commenting, by liking uh, certain videos. And if you guys want to continue to do so, spread the love, please do so. Now, what I need to do is I need to start answering a lot of questions you guys had. And honestly, guys, I didn't start this by, and I didn't know how we're supposed to grow a channel. And my, in, my intention was just, hey, put some videos out and show the work. And we got a flood of people, and a flood of subscribers, and a flood of patients from all over the world. And during that process, you know, uh, we have all these comments. I'd like to an start answering all these comments. And if you guys have any comments, uh, questions specifically about chiropractic, about health, I would love to answer them. I do want to be mindful, uh, you know, certain questions I cannot answer on social media. This is not a, uh, a critique. This is not a comparison. This is just, I'll give you my straight up opinion and realize that it, this is my opinion. Okay? And let's give it a shot. So I have a bunch of questions here. And I'll read the name of the person it came from. I'll read the question and I'll do the best in my ability to go ahead and answer it. Okay? So here we go. Okay, so Vic B. Hello, doctor. What books or manuals do you recommend reading for a chiropractic student? And I think this is, there's a couple of great books that I think everyone should read. Uh, chiropractic Student and even others. First book I would recommend people read as a chiropractic student is White and Punjabi. White and Punjabi were considered the authorities on the biomechanics of the spine. The book is called Clinical Biomechanics of the Spine. Um, fantastic information in there, everything relating to the disc, all the characteristics of the disc and what the function of the disc really is. The second book is Guyton's Physiology. Third book is going to be Gray's Anatomy. And no, not Gray's Anatomy, the show, but Gray's Anatomy, the anatomy book. And what was a cool story told to us is that Dr. Gonston, whenever he couldn't figure out a case, he would go to anatomy and physiology. So understand the anatomy of the condition understand the physiology of the condition. So let's say there was a, a particular organ problem. Understand the anatomy of that organ, understand the physiology of that organ, understand how all those nerves, understand which nerves affect that organ, whether they're sympathetic or parasympathetic, whether they speed up or slow down, how they affect the actual functioning. So Guyton's Physiology, Gray's Anatomy, uh, Clinical Biomechanics of the Spine by White and Punjabi. A couple of great books that have recently come out um, are, or that have been out, Mastery and Mastering Your Vocation by Robert Greene. Um, I think is a fantastic book. I've gone through it a few times and understanding what an apprenticeship really is and how long it really takes uh, to be in an apprentice. Uh, picking the right master, picking the right mentors um, and what as a student you should be getting from your mentor and also when it's time to leave and pursue your dreams. Um, another great book, uh, Atomic Habits is a new book that just was recently introduced to me and I really, really enjoy this book and it's using little, ba little habits in your everyday life to get the big effect of your life and your plan. Um, so those are some great books. There's a lot of great books. I love Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, Understanding the Pain Body. Uh, if you're talking about philosophy books, the green books um, are fantastic. Understanding chiropractic philosophy. There is a saying that a doctor without philosophy is just a technician. So if you want to be just a technician, then it doesn't really matter what your philosophy is. Gonstead is a philosophy. Gonstead Chiropractic is a philosophy, science, and art. So there's a great quote in the book. It's, uh, science is knowledge reduced to law and embodied in a system. Art relates to something to be done. Science teaches us to know and art to do. So the science and art, but the philosophy is why. Why are we doing all this? Why do we have chiropractors on the planet? We'll get to that in some other questions, okay? RPM designs. 
how did you get into this practice? Like, where does your urge come from to heal other people? That's a lengthy um, answer, but let's see if I can narrow it down. Uh, it comes from my mom, and my mom was loved to help people, and that's what I grew up around. She was always taking people to the doctor, to the acupuncturist, to the chiropractor, to the massage therapist, making her Ayurvedic, po Ayurvedic potions at home, you know, home remedies that she learned, uh, Indian home remedies, Indian African home remedies, and I saw that a lot. And, you know, I wanted to help people. I just didn't know how I wanted to help people. And uh, how I got into chiropractic specifically, I'll answer in some other questions, but where it came from my mother. Um, okay, Norma Ariola. One more question, Doug. Would breast augmentation drastically change the anatomy of chest that could impact the back that could cause back issues? The answer is yes and no, depending on your cup size. So breast augmentation, I have a few patients that have breast augmentation. The challenge with, uh, there's a couple of things with breast augmentation is number one, what is the material that you're using? Number two is what is the purpose of the breast augmentation? Are people doing breast augmentation because they have a self-image issue? And if it's a self-image issue, you don't like the way you look, the book I would recommend you read is by Maxwell Maltz, uh, The New Psycho-Cybernetics, and he talks a lot about these image issues. And he was a plastic surgeon uh, f until the age of 60 where he then retired and he realized he didn't really help anybody with he did help severe trauma and burn victims with plastic surgery but most of the augmentations he did didn't really change the person's behavior or life it was a short-term fix for a, a long-term or an old problem um, how does it affect the back well depending on the size and how much of this you're putting on yes I do have some people who are uh, heavy chested or heavy upper body and so it causes a rounding it can cause kyphosis of the thoracic spine in adjusting a uh, patient with breast augmentation you don't it's you're not able to go through the joint as well and so what happens is you um, it's 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 a stiffer set so if you're trying to adjust that patient you're not able to feed through the very end so you have to be it's a quicker set Okay, that was for you students out there. Mm, Levi Obias, can chiropractic medicine alleviate aneurysms? Well, first of all, uh, let's not call this chiropractic medicine. They're two separate things. We're not using chiropractic as medicine. Chiropractic is a lifestyle. Okay, so, and we'll get into more of that later. So chiropractic is basically uh, maintaining the neurological integrity of the nervous system through checking and making sure that all the spinal bones, including the foundation specific to Gonsa, the pelvic analysis, sacrum and, and pelvis, and everything is in proper alignment, proper juxtaposition. There's no pressure on the nerves. When things are in proper alignment, what happens? There's less energy expenditure for those muscles just to keep the person upright. Medicine or allopathy is designed to, let's use a, a something against the pathogen. So define your pathogen and give it something to knock it out like a poison and hopefully that not too many other things uh, deteriorate along the process. So allopathy is very different from chiropractic. Both have their place. Alleviating aneurysms. Aneurysm. What is an aneurysm? And is chiropractic medicine uh, alleviating an aneurysm? Well, we have to look at the answer. The first answer is going to be no. The next question or the right question is what caused the aneurysm in the first place? Number one. Number two, was, was it due to lifestyle? Was it poor diet? Was it genetic? Was it nerve pressure causing some sort of obstruction? And when we're looking at whether it's an aneurysm or anything else in the body, what is health? And I think that's a more important question to ask is what is health? So to me, health is uh, defined this way. It's 100% of your body parts working at 100%, 100% of the time. And if there is interference or obstruction anywhere in the body, body is not able to function at 100% any of those ways. And if it's not functioning correctly, then what happens? 
we have malfunction. So it's either functioning or it's malfunctioning. If it's malfunctioning, the malfunction produces a symptom. The symptom then is labeled as a disease. And then we start to figure out, well, why do we get all these symptoms? Toy hunter gamers. Cobra, what do you see specifically in the x-rays that immediately leads you to know that there are digestive challenges currently or waiting in the future of a patient when you're looking at those x-rays? Toy hunting gamers, that's a fantastic question. And what I'm looking for are several factors. The first thing I look at is the meganblasi. And the meganblasi is that gastric air bubble. Do they have the right size? How does it look? Then I'm looking at the colon overall. So I'm looking at soft tissue structures first. So when we're looking at the colon, I'm starting at the ascending colon, transverse descending. Is there undigested food? Is there too much gas? But first I look at the meganblasi, then I look at the colon. Then I look at the area that controls or starts the process of digestion. We can be talking about upper cervical or more, we can be talking about the middle of the back between the shoulder blades. And there are nerves there that control the different organs of digestion. So when I start to see all that, I kind of know something's happening. Um, to what extent, I don't know until we dive deeper into the case. Adrian Pascu or Pascu, what can you do at home to correct kyphosis? Probably this is from leaning in a bad position at the computer, reading and studying. Would really appreciate a thumbs up on this, thanks. Well, Adrian, you kind of answered your own question here. And when you're talking about kyphosis, you're talking about rounded back, right? So I'm gonna use a spine model. We got two models here. We got the baby spine and we got the, the big spine. I'll use the big spine right now. So we're ideally designed to have 60 degree reciprocating curves. That's how we're designed. These are the spinal defense mechanisms or this is the curvature one should have. The front of the spine, this is 60 degrees forward, 60 degrees back, 60 degrees forward. Well, when everyone's studying, what are they doing? They're just kind of doing that whole hunch over C, right? And what is that doing to the body? Well, all these muscles and ligaments are adapting. And what happens, let's say all these are adapting to this new position. And they did a study that, this is an old Stanford study. The body will acquire the position it's in within, within a five to 10 year period. So being in this position for a period of time, guess what happens? These ligaments all shorten, some shorten, some lengthen. Now, coming up from this position, we try to come up and we get pops and crackles. So how do we correct this? You change your posture. The first thing you guys can do is, I talk about sitting on a yoga ball and getting up, put an alarm, put an alarm on your phone. And every 40 minutes, 45 minutes, get up and walk around. Um, sit on a yoga ball, sit on a, uh, we have these little discs that are inflatable. The whole idea is get moving and looking at your posture, sitting up straight. Um, you can, there's another little trick you can do. You can practice bringing your belly button in and up. Hold it in that position as I'm doing right now and having maintaining a conversation or study, study habits, whether you're on the computer, keep that belly button in and up. Keep that belly button in and up, okay? And uh, there's another couple of exercises we'll add later on, but I think to recap, number one, get up every 40 minutes, 45, 50 minutes max. Uh, bring your belly button in and up. Practice sitting on a yoga ball. Sit stand desks or just change your, your studying or, or computer positions from a desk to a counter and vice versa. Uh, I don't ever recommend studying on the floor, okay? Some circumstances in certain areas of the world where they are just studying on the floor, well, you need to get up then and just move around, okay? From Sleepy AE31. My love and well wishes to you and your family. Big virtual hug. For a chiropractic question, what can one do for a dowager hump? I've seen some YouTube chiropractors say that it can be reduced and some say that it is a permanent change. Good question. I think I know what you guys are talking about. I think you're talking about that hump, right? You're looking at this big bump. Like uh, a lot of these older people have, uh, not just older, just bad posture. They're like this. So the question is, can you fix that hump? That hump, as I've seen, is usually not coming from that area. It is usually a compensation lower down in the, in the thoracic spine. 
It can be from dishing, which comes down from T7. It can be from a, a pelvic imbalance. The whole point is, if you have this hump here and it's not really a structural issue, it's usually a postural issue from what I've seen. So some people are able to correct this. Have I had these cases we've corrected? Yes. Have I had cases that we haven't corrected? Yes. Um, it goes back to frequency and lifestyle. Okay, thank you so much. You mentioned that you were, there was an online class to learn more about Gonset Method. That is still, is that still on the table? If yes, when and where can I sign up? Because you're, you, you're, you have the passion and ability to transmit knowledge. Uh, that's still on the table. Uh, we're still working on it. Uh, nothing is there just yet, but when something is, I will announce it. Uh, Ifany M, blessings to you and your family. I have two questions. Do chiropractic adjustments help with grief and trauma? How would someone go about finding a chiropractor for their pet? That's a good question, okay? And I'll talk about question one. Do chiropractic adjustments help with grief and trauma? Um, from my, ex this is my experience now. I've had a lot of cases where people are holding a lot of trauma in their, uh, emotional trauma in their bodies. They're holding grief. I have people coming to me after uh, a parent, a loved one, uh, a pet, someone has passed away and they're just holding all this stuff in their body, all this stress, all this tension. Um, I have people that have been holding traumas in their body for years, for five years, 10 years, 40 years. And as we start that process and you start to give them very specific adjustments, I don't wanna say that the adjustment itself, you know, you're asking do chiropractic adjustments help with it? I can say from my experience that through adjusting these patients, they have had tremendous uh, emotional uh, releases. Uh, a lot of their grief has come out. Is that every single one that had it? No. When they're ready to let go, when the person is ready to let go, then it happens. If the person is not ready, they're fighting. And you'll see it in, in my videos. They're, they're just fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting and they don't want to let go. They want to hold that story. They want to hold that, that trauma. But in general, I will say that the adjustments I've given to many, many patients, hundreds of patients, they have had that release of grief and they have had that uh, emotional release uh, from past traumas, physical and emotional. How would someone go about finding a chiropractor for their pets? I do believe there are uh, specific chiropractic, you know, there are vets that do uh, adjustments for pets. There are chiropractic, there's a veterinarian, there are chiropractic veterinarians, or there are chiropractors that specialize in pet adjusting. There has been also an increased miscarriage and newborn infant mortality during the pandemic period. Have you observed this within your patient population? Uh, well, I, I kind of experienced it for ourselves we you know my wife had a double miscarriage over during the pandemic but on the on the happier side we also had a beautiful uh, baby girl and uh, we had that before uh, so have I seen it in my patient population there have been um, about three patients that had either single or double miscarriages I've had a few patients that have gone through IVF. This is actually a really cool story I will share. So I've had a few patients that had uh, IVF and they were unsuccessful. And their spouses that were patients, uh, the women had unsuccessful IVF implantation and, the, women, and the, the husbands were patients and asked if I would see them. And so we just went through a week to two weeks of chiropractic adjustments, nothing. We're not treating anything, we're just looking for nerve pressure, fixing, correcting, working on the foundation, and it was really cool. All of them were having successful implantations after one to two weeks of, of care, where prior they didn't. Could there have been other factors associated with that? Sure, but uh, they attribute it to having a more balanced uh, foundation. Okay, hi doc, I just love your videos, the way you treat patients. I have a high hip and short leg issue after my slip disc. This is from Crady E. 
Uh, does misalignment cure permanently or do we need visits throughout our life? Does alignment cause inflammation? These are, please reply. Okay, this is a good question. Dude. Do misalignments cure permanently? That's a great question. And the analogy I like to use is the car alignment because it is mechanical just like the spine is mechanical. It's biomechanical. Let's say your car, you're driving to work, you, you hit a pothole, you hit several potholes, your car goes out of alignment, what do you do? You go get an alignment. If you don't get alignment, what happens? Then the tires wear unevenly and it eventually goes to the bushings and the, and the tie rod and the axle and eventually to the transmission. It follows what's called kinetic chain, uh, similar in the human body. Now, let's say you get the alignment fixed but you still are driving the same way to work, hitting the same potholes. Is that a permanent fix? Come on, guys. Now, here's the cool part in the Gonstead work. If there is a foundational imbalance, the goal is to, is to stabilize the foundation, as you guys have heard me talk so much in the videos. So the idea is stabilize, have a level base and foundation so the adjustments will hold longer we are mechanical in nature. Anything mechanical does what? It breaks down. It requires some sort of maintenance. Um, so the idea is to figure out with every patient that comes in uh, what's out of alignment, what's out of balance, put them back in balance, what is correctable. So just because you correct something doesn't mean it's permanent. And guys, there is no permanent fix for anything. I've had patients come in and say, hey, do I need this surgery? I'm like, You're, you can choose as you wish. But once you, you know, a surgery isn't a permanent fix of anything either. It may uh, allevi alleviate your pain and discomfort at that particular area. But once you have fixation, whether it's adhesion, scar tissue, degeneration, arthritic changes, spondylosis, uh, rods, uh, you know, um, uh, pins, whatever. Once you have fixation in the spine, this is the, this is the human body. This is, in my opinion, this is how the human body works. It compensates. So we have these, let's say this area is fixated. The area above will become hypermobile to compensate for it. So now we have uneven movement. We have more movement than normal, so things will wear out unevenly. Um, it's similar when you have the subluxation. And, you know, that's the big elusive word I would like to talk about today. So when we look at the disc, we're going to talk about this functional spinal unit and Gonston, its theory on the subluxation and the disc theory of subluxation. When you look at the disc, we're taking a cross section. We have this nucleus, which is a non-compressible substance. We have the annulus. The annulus are these fibers. 22 degrees of concentric layers of, of tissue that's holding this nucleus in place. So I want you to think of it this way. Think of this nucleus as this big ball of yarn that's compressed down into this little pivotal ball bearing right here. And it's held together by the annulus. And the annulus, they are compressible structures. This is non-compressible. So this is your pivot, your ball bearing. It allows your six degrees of motion to occur. Now, different parts of the spine have different degrees of motion. This is the lumbar spine. Let's look at the cross section. Gonstead's theory is that the discs are designed to be level and parallel. And when the discs have their optimal parallel alignment and relationship to one another, what happens is that functional spinal unit is working at its best. You, we have our proper curvature. Nerve flow is unimpeded and you have all the muscles and ligaments working as they should and your basal metabolic rate is low, meaning it's not a lot of energy to just sit there and be, okay? Now, what happens when we have misalignment? Trauma initiates that misalignment. That trauma does what? When we're talking about trauma, slips, falls, accidents, bad posture can lead to it. How does bad posture misalign over time? It's, there's a property of the disc called creep. C-R-E-E-P, and through the process of creep, that thing will slowly misalign, okay? I'm not gonna get into creep right now. Let's talk about misalignment. Let's talk about trauma and the slips, falls, and accidents, and things go out of place, they go back in, they go out of place, they go back in. Now, 
when it goes out of place and it dislodges off, trauma initiates a subluxation. Trauma initiates by uh, moving the vertebrae posterior. It's dislodging off its nucleus. So it's doing what? It's doing this. And it can tilt back at the same time. That, when it dislodges off the nucleus, it creates what happens to the, the pivot, the nucleus. It compresses into the annulus. We said the annulus is, is compressible. So it's basically rubbing into the annulus. We get a little bit of damage of the annulus internally. We have inflammation. That inflammation then goes out where? It goes to the weakest point, which is the posterior lateral part of the disc. And that's what puts irritation on that nerve. And wherever that nerve goes, there's less function. When we're looking at the nerve root, when we take a cross section of this nerve root, we have thousands of nerve fibers going through there, okay? And as we're looking at the nerve root, that, that irritation or pressure can put pressure on any one of those fibers within that nerve root. It can do all of them. And depending on where it's going, it can produce a multitude of symptoms. So the goal of the of the Gonstead chiropractor, the goal we're looking at is find that misalignment, find the irritation of the nerve, use the bony lever as a contact. It's a three-dimensional misalignment, so the first direction it misaligns is posterior. Then it can wedge up on the left or right. Then it can, so it goes back, wedge, and then it can turn, and that's where we get our three-dimensional listing. I know I've repeated this a lot of times, but I think it's kind of important. I'm showing a close-up today, okay? And so the goal is to then position it in the exact opposite way. If it's gone back, up, and right, which way do we want to go? Left or to center and back forward onto the disc. Once it's reestablished on the disc and the pressure is up, that's when you leave it alone. And that's the difference in the Gonstead work is knowing when to leave it alone. Once you've fixed the problem, this is the challenge now for doctor and patient. Doctor is a chiropractor. What do we do as chiropractors? We want to crack things, right? Well, that's when we have to leave it alone. And that's when we have to let nature take its course. Okay. We leave it alone. Nature takes its course. Okay. Now on the patient side, they have very specific instructions. They're told to just walk in ice, get hydrated and reduced inflammatory foods. And they just like, when can I go to the gym? When can I do this? When can I do that? They don't want to give the body time to heal or they're sedentary. They're going to sit around on their computer for work. I'm not saying it in a bad way. It's just the reality of life. You need that movement. Number one, you need to focus on, on posture and curvature so that this can heal properly. Those that do follow those instructions usually heal up well and usually get the fix they're looking for. And back in Gonsa's time, I think it was a higher percentage. I think back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it was a little bit different. Today, everyone is rushed. We're all distracted. And nobody wants to take the time to heal. Okay? So that was a lengthy answer. And do we need many visits through our life? Yes, it is important to get checked. What are you getting checked for? You're getting checked to see, are you clear of what? Of pressure, of interference. So you hear me in my videos say you're clear. That's my job as the chiropractor. Where's the irritation? Where's the pressure? Clear the spine, let the person go and be. And so depending on lifestyle, age, gender, all these different factors, you know, everyone's different. I have people come in once a week, twice a, uh, twice a month. I have people that come in once a month. I have people that come in every quarter. I have people that come in once a year. I have people come in only when they hurt after I fix the problem. So that you have to go seek your own individual care. As you seek your individual care and figure out with your x-rays, then uh, you know your chiropractor will uh, prescribe or recommend you know hey come get checked every so often so when you're coming to me you're not coming for an adjustment okay you're coming to get checked and once you get checked if there's something I, I, I'm gonna clear it okay that's my job does alignment cause inflammation I think you meant does misalignment cause inflammation and yes that's exactly the process we just talked about all right 
Uh, are there any patients, this is from Charles Gomez, are there any patients that chiropractors cannot treat? Some people have some really tough problems, was just wondering, have a good day. Okay, so um, here's my philosophy. Every person can get checked. Every person, every sick person, my philosophy as I was taught, every sick person has nerve pressure somewhere in their spine. Does it mean I am chasing their pain? Absolutely not. But everyone has a spine, everyone has a nervous system. When there is interference between brain and body, the body cannot function at its optimal best. So our job here is, or my job here is to see, is there clear communication? Is everything in proper alignment? So in my opinion, um, it's not about treat. Can everyone have a chiropractic exam? Yes. We can then determine if they're actually uh, a candidate for chiropractic care, but everyone can get a chiropractic exam. I have, um, I have an interesting case right now. It was a diving accident. Uh, it's a tetraple uh, a person who was in a diving accident and lost the uh, functioning of the arms and legs, not 100%, but mostly in a wheelchair right now. And we're working on the neck and he's going through a lot of rehab here. He's here from Europe and he's actually doing pretty well. And maybe if he lets me uh, film a, a visit, maybe we'll do it. But I'm working uh, on his cervical. Uh, that's my main focus for right now. We'll eventually get to other places. The diving accident caused three to four fractures, which led to uh, fusion with rods. And in his case, he needed that. He needed it. But there are other things where there's pressure. And what was really cool, first visit, we adjusted him, the C6, a lot of pressure and he was already getting range of motion. He didn't have this movement up and down, and uh, it was pretty loud. And hopefully we can share uh, one of his visits here over the next four or five months. All right, all the best doc, take care. Uh, for a seated cervical adjustment, can you explain the type of subluxation you are facing as, a, as an example and the vector force of correction you are using? This is from Gerald Tour. Maybe you're a chiropractic student. Well, this is exactly what we were saying, right? We're looking at the three-dimensional uh, misalignment. It goes posterior, it wedges one side, and then it either rotates right or left, and there are special static listings in the Gonset system, PR, PL, PRS, PLS, PRI, PLI, so on and so forth, in the cervical. So the intent of the adjustment is this. We're lifting the segment, Okay, because it's gone posterior and goes slightly back wedges. So we're lifting the segment and setting it. The vector is through the plane line of the disc. So the lateral x-ray will give us the line of correction. The A to P film will give us what? <laughs> the A to P film gives us the static listing and the contact point. Are you contacting the spinous? Actually, let me use this one. You know, are you contacting the spinous process? Is it C7, single spinous? Is it a bifid spinous? So are we doing a spinous contact? Or are we doing a lamina contact? And so we're coming in, we're lifting the bone, you're lifting it and setting it forward. And so the lateral film gives, us, gives you the line of correction. The A to P film gives you the contact point. And the vector, again, is determined by the lateral film. Hi, this is from Sabo. Hi, I want to be a chiropractor like you. And in France, the job isn't recognized as medicine, but chiropractors are considered as an expert of the spine. My question is, is it a problem if it's not recognized as medicine? Should I be a doctor in medicine and then become a chiropractor? Like that, I will be recognized as a doctor completely. By the way, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for reading my comments. Sorry if my English isn't good. Sabo, good question. Um, there's actually, when you're looking at it, um, in Europe, I believe most of them are master programs in chiropractic. Here in America, it's a doctor of chiropractic or a doctorate. So we are considered 
and legally considered primary care physicians and as such you don't need a referral from a medical doctor. And the big misconception is, you know, people think that a doctor is just a medical doctor. That's what, that's what has evolved from terminology. A PhD is a doctor. Doctor means teacher. That's where it comes from. And so you had to have a PhD back in the day, right? So you have a PhD. A PhD is a doctor. An MD is a doctor. A doctor of osteopathy, doctor of chiropractic, doctor of philosophy. And, but really when you look at it, doctor means teacher. But if you're talking about a medical doctor, the question is, do you need to be a medical doctor? And I'm going to rewind and share a little story, okay? This is a personal story. And after I became a chiropractor, uh, about two years in, I was getting pretty frustrated because patients and potential patients were coming in saying, hey, my doctor says not to see you. Well, then why are you here? So I got to a point, I got really frustrated, and I said, you know what, maybe I'll go back to medical school just to get my MD. And a friend of mine said, do you really need that? And who are you really doing that for? Are you doing it for your own ego? And I think, yes, I was doing it for my own ego. So I let it go and I said, we're just demonstrating what chiropractic is, specifically what Gonset Chiropractic is. Yes, is it time? Okay, I gotta get back to seeing patients. I'll see you guys soon, bye.